Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, uh, Steve made a mention about BLAST, and maybe sometimes like BLAST, but BLAST. So BLAST, it stands for like Bible Learning and Spiritual Training. And it's a program that we do for the kids that get out early in the schools in our district right around here. And it's a really fun program. We'll have 70 to 80 kids packing up this place in here, making chairs to back out, move them out in this games. So if you have that time space available, you, are, you would be desiring to be here to help, okay? Because there's need, always need for help for that. Well, this morning, we're going to look at the second parable in the, in the Bible that we've been looking at. We're doing this new series called Stories That Change Your Life. And they're all about parables. And the parable that I've chosen today is the parable of the soils. It's in Mark chapter 4. We're, that's what we're going to look at is in Mark chapter 4. It's also in, in Matthew chapter 13 and Luke, first, Luke chapter 8. So Jesus, you know, the three of the different um, gospel writers included it in their story. But what is a parable? The word parable, it comes from the Greek word parabole. Parabolo. Para, you think of parallel, right? Two things going alongside each other, okay? And then ballo is to throw out. So it was a story that Jesus threw out that went alongside, and it was to teach them a spiritual truth. It was to really help them to be able to understand, get their attention, to capture their attention, to help them to think, to imagine what God was trying to say into their lives, what he was trying to say into their lives, to understand the meaning better. Ah. Uh, and so we're going to read this. If you have your Bible, you can grab a Bible. If you don't have one, grab one in the pew in front of you. Mark chapter 4. Let's start reading in verse 1. It says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat on it in the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. I like to talk to you about parables. You know, one thing I, I read this week in, in about parables, this, I thought this was a great description. It said, a parable is a picture that arrests our attention and arouses our interest. So we see this picture that catches our attention, and then it's a mirror which we suddenly see ourselves in. So it also, more than just a picture, becomes a mirror that we can see ourselves in, and then it becomes a window which we can see how God is revealing his truth to us, how God's working on his truth to us. So those were three depths of a parable that I thought were interesting. So it really helps us to respond so we can see God's truth live in our lives more. So we continue on in verse 2. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, and here he starts, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell on thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. So this physical story that he's telling us, agrarian society, back then this was a very agrarian. They all grew their own crops and depended on those. He talks about these four kinds of soils. One falls in the hard soil. The path that went around the garden, and it fell on that. And naturally, it's not going to get into the dirt. It's laying on top of the soil, the hard soil. And the birds come down and eat up those seeds. Then there was those that fell among the rocks. Whether there were rocks that were raked up around, or in that Judean area, it's known that there was a lot of a underlying area of rock. And so the shallow, the dirt, the, the soil would be shallow at places. And so whether it was really shallow soil or it was a pile of rocks, it fell among those, it grew up, started to produce, but then when it got hot out, there was no moisture, the moisture dried up from the ground, and those plants, they withered away and they died. And then there was the crowded soil, or what we're going to, thorny, it talks about thorny or weedy soil in here, I'm going to call it crowded soil today. Because what was the situation? Those seeds fell among the, the, the weeds that were already growing outside the garden area, and those weeds were established, and those seeds could never become productive. They never grew up. They, they, they were just kind of a weak, stringy, gangly plant that grew, but it never could become productive because those weeds were crowding out the good light that those plants needed. But then he talked about there was that good soil, and those were the ones that grew up and produced a crop 30, 60, or 100 times. The next verse is 9, 10, 11. We're going to jump over those, or uh, 9 through 12. We're going to jump over those, and we're going to go into the spiritual application of how he connects this to people's lives. So if you read in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus said to them, and this is the part, that mirror part, that's going to reflect back to them. They're going to be able to look and say, hey, where am I at? Or they're going to be able to see the truth of God's word as they look at that window. He says, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. 
As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown to them. Others, like seed sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still other seed like so, or still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop thirty six or even a hundred times what was sown. I didn't think I mentioned this in your bulletin. There's some notes you might want to take those out and follow along with me, and um, you can fill in some blanks. Now the first thing I want to talk about is who are the characters. In the parts of the story. Well, the first thing is that it says the seed is the word. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the gospel that goes out. It's the good news that, that we hear. It's the good news we share. It's the good news of the, of, of the Bible that comes out. And ultimately, ah, it's the things that we share too. The next thing is who is the farmer? Well, the farmer is God. That's how we're going to look at the farmer here in this story today. Is we're going to look at the farmer as God. Ultimately, we become farmers when we share that seed. But we're just going to focus today on God's the farmer. He is the good farmer. And then the third thing is the soil. Who is the soil? Well, that's you and me. That's our hearts. That's the things that we um, that we have different conditions in our lives. And there's, so we are either one of these four kinds of soil. We're either hard, shallow, crowded, or we're good soil. It's really important that we evaluate our heart. That we look at where is my heart at? What's the state of my heart? And that's a question you can ask yourself today. Now, in Proverbs 4.23, is an important verse that says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Above all else, guard your heart, because it's the wellspring of life. And so it's really important that we evaluate, where is my heart at? You know, if Jesus wanted them to evaluate their hearts back then, don't you think we should evaluate our hearts today? So that's what I might hope today is that as we go through this, you can evaluate your heart. And maybe it's not just in the, have you accepted the word of God in your life, but there's other areas, whether it's in relationships or whether all kinds of areas in your life, you might evaluate, where am I at? Am I hard, shallow, crowded, or good soil? So let's look at each one of these types of soil. The first one, in verse 13, some people like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word. It was sown in them. And we call this the hard soil. These are the people that they hear God's word. And just like the birds came and ate those seeds up, Satan comes and takes those seeds away from them. Now, as I was preparing this message, I thought of some of you and stories that I've heard. And I thought of someone that's a hard soil that I want to example today. Everybody's going, is it me? <laughs> no, and, and so I'm, um, this is all pretty pre-organized, but... David Gonzalez is one, a person that had some hard soil in his life that I want to talk about today. So come on up here, David. I want to have him share a little bit how he was hard. Some of you may go, oh, he's hard because of this jersey he wears, right? Yes. <laughs> no, but Dave, why don't you tell people a time in your life when you were hard? All right. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe like 13 years ago. Uh, I think one example Brad wanted me to share is like, I went to a &P school in Daytona Beach, Florida. Not a very good place out for school, kind of weird. But um, I definitely didn't know God back then. I was like, always considered myself an atheist. I grew up in a Catholic family and that kind of pushed me away. But like, we would go down Daytona Beach, you know, where all the partying was and everything. And there was always people down there that were preaching the word. And it was always, I always felt like, they, my friends would make fun of me because like, they would pick me out. They'd come to me and like, do you, do you think you're saved? Do you believe you're going to heaven? I'm like, oh my goodness, like what, do I have a sign on my forehead? Like, go away, you know? And we were pretty mean to them. I was pretty mean to them. It would happen on several occasions. I mean, there was even one time, it was spring break, we're on the beach. The place is absolutely crowded, you know, everybody's drinking and you know, all kinds of goofiness going around. And there was just this young guy, you know, walking up and down the beach asking people, do you believe you're saved? Do you believe you're going to heaven? And all we did was just shoot him away, you know, make fun of him. And back then I just thought it was hilarious, but like, now I realize, man, that was one brave dude. All those people, 
I mean, you want to talk about bravery, doing that and that scene amongst all those people, that was that was something else. Okay, so yeah, so when David, when I remember when he told me the story years ago, and he's talked about how they mocked this guy on the beach and just ridiculed him. And that's an example of Parcel. He didn't receive it to his heart, but there was change that happened. So briefly give people, how did you go from hard soil to good soil? What was what was the things that happened in the world? Um, I guess the biggest one was meeting my wife. She was, uh, when we met, she had been a Christian already for a couple of years. I definitely wasn't. But you know, we, we started dating and everything, but then she told me the rules of her being a Christian. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the first time we, she wanted me to do, you know, a prayer with her of faith, of receiving the word, receiving God in my heart. And I did that first time. But as Brad said, that was hard soil. I didn't really receive it. I just said it so she would leave me alone. <laughs> and it took about three years of her, her whole family, family just praying. I didn't know about this. I was being attacked from the side of my I had no idea if this was going on. But they were always constantly praying for me to, to have a change of heart. And, you know, like when we were, we got married, like through the court first, I still wasn't a Christian. But she had faith that, you know, I would change one day. And I used to be a contractor, you know, like with working on airplanes and whatnot. And I had a job, really good job in Illinois. And then the factory, like, lost its contract with the Navy. And they shut down. And I got laid off. And a lot of things happened where basically I ended up here with another job, living in an RV in front of Jerry Sobranke. <laughs> So he probably kind of helped break up that soil pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and that was about eight years ago. So, you know, I've been going to this church ever since then. And I told Jerry a few years ago, you know, when I was, I re Jerry was the only one that basically like allowed me to live there on the RV. Cause I was going through Craigslist looking who let me park. It was her stepdad's RV. And like everybody would be like, oh no, it's not available anymore. Oh, I have a dog. And they're like, no, we don't take dogs. You know, Jerry let me live there, but a lot of things happened from here to from Illinois to coming here. And I was ready to receive the word again. And I received it for real this time. And I felt it changing my life and my heart. Um, you know, like reading the Bible, like I started to make sense. I was like, man, this is cool. Before I would try to read it, I'm like, this is gibberish, this is nonsense. But I started reading it again, and it's like, you know, I feel a change. My family can see a change because I don't see them that often. They all live on the East Coast in Boston, obviously. And I go back and they're like, David, you've changed so much. Like, I used to be like the black sheep of the family. But, you know, yeah, a lot of things change. And I told Jerry, you know, when I was when I did the Lord's Prayer with him, and I received the Lord in my heart, I told him, you know, even though I did that prayer, I told myself, I'm gonna watch this man's life, because I live right in front of his house. And I'm like, if I see the same hypocrisy that I saw with my family, being Catholics, like, I'm not doing this. I'm just gonna walk away. But, you know, here I am. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> You know, one of the things that's been fun is David and Louisa, is they understand something new in God's word. David's the kind of guy that he jumps aboard, he takes it and says, no, this is going to apply to my life. And they start changing life. You know, and that, that's an example of, a, of softness in his soil, or so, softness of his heart, is God's taking that hard heart and turning it into good soil. What was it? It was Satan that came and stole those seeds away. And there is this battle that's going on that we don't see going on, where Satan's really the one that comes and steals the seeds away. So this morning, one thing that each one of us needs to ask is, is, are you giving the seed a chance in your life? If you're not at that place, if you consider yourself as a spiritually hard soil, my encouragement this morning is give the seed a chance in your life today. Let's move on to the second soil. Verse 16. Others, like seeds sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. 
But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. These we call the shallow soil. And those are people that they hear God's word, they receive it in their heart, they get excited, they start growing, but then there's some pressure that comes in life, some troubles come in their life, and they, the shallow soil, and they, and they wither away and die. Now, an example I have, you already see it, an example I have of this um, not being a shallow soil is my friend Russ Nuts. I was the youth leader around here, and in 1983, Russ was a kid that lived in the neighborhood, just a crazy kid, going into ninth grade, who some friends invited him to go to church camp. And so he came to church camp, and he really became a Christian. That's when I met him. We worked with him through youth group, him and his friends. That year, they went to Canyon Park Junior High. There was no Skyview Junior High at that time, or Skyview Middle School. And he went to Canyon Park, and he was just all excited about his new faith in Christ. And he was sharing with everybody. And we had kids coming around here. We had an incredible revival going on in that school. And he was really a big part of it. And so I was trying to feed this fire in his life. Now, there was another person at play in his life, and that was his dad. He lived with his, just with his dad. And his dad wasn't so excited about this stuff that was going on in his life. And, um, you know, like it was in the summer, there was all these activities. He had a lot of free time. It came time to school, and his dad said, Rush, you need to slow down a little bit. You're doing too many things in life. You need to cut out some things. We don't want you going to church anymore. And at that time, this was some pressure that was coming in his life. I didn't know what was going to happen, right? Because it's, there's, this, there's this battle that's going on, these trouble, this persecution, in a sense, that's coming on. I mean, his dad loved him and cared for him, but he didn't really have any spiritual life. His dad was pretty hard. But Russ, through that whole thing, we stayed with together, and we stayed, and he kept on pursuing after God. And this is kind of how he lived his life. He lived everything to the extreme. This is just, my wife, when I was told my wife wasn't going to talk about it, I said, I'm going to use Russ as an example of not being shallow self. She said, Brad, I just saw some picture on Facebook, and he was with his family this week at some lake, and he was jumping off a cliff or something. But anyway, so... But there's this example, and, and Russ went on, and he pursued God, and ultimately then he was the youth leader here, and then when we started Park Ridge Community Church, he was the pastor, and I was actually his associate. And then, uh, in, I think, 2005 or, or seven, there was a bunch of families moved north, and he took over a church up in Smoky Point, and so he still pastors that church, and he's pursuing life and, and seeing God's goodness. But he was an example, someone that did not let the pressures, the troubles of life, to take, take the life that had been formed in him away. And it's a challenge. It's, it's a sad story about how many people kind of have this flashing pan experience. You know, they come unto God, they come into a relationship with God, but then the pressures in life come in, and it, and it kind of withers away and dies. So the point here that we can really take is I think that we need to remove the rocks in our lives. Work on removing the rocks in our lives. What are those rocks? There's a whole aspect of bitterness and anger. There's habits that we can have in life that can keep us from really being able to pursue God. There can be relationships in life that put pressure on us. To keep us from doing and pursuing God. Let me say this. Russ always honored his dad. And he would always do what his dad asked. And, but he continued to pursue after God. And through that whole thing, God really was able to work in his life. So that's the, the shallow soils. And I don't know where you're at in your life. You may go, you know, I've got some shallow areas. The challenge today is we see Jesus told this story. That we take it and we, and we change our life. We start getting rid of the rocks. And we become the good soil. We move from the hard soil, the shallow soil, and become the good soil. The third one is... In verse uh, 18, still others like seeds sown among the thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And I'm calling these the crowded soil. There's those weeds and the thorns that compete for space in our life. When my boys were young, I, I grew up always having a garden, a vegetable garden. And so when my boys were young, hey, let's have a vegetable garden. So I remember tilling the soil, getting it all ready, planting all these rows of peas and corn and lettuce and all these different things. And then they started growing. I was doing, I was pretty diligent about weeding it. And then we have a thing around here called fireworks, which happens in June and then early July, right? And so we run all these fireworks stands. Well, that consumed my energy, okay? So for this month, I was doing that. And so then I'd come back after fireworks, back to my garden, and you know what it was? It looked like a big green mat. It was weeds all over the place. The thing was more weeds. It's amazing how weeds grow faster than the, you know, the, the plants you planted. And so I'd go in there and, and weed out those weeds. And uh, what I would find is my plants that I planted, they were there, but they were just kind of stringly and gangly and yellow, and they weren't just really thriving and flourishing. And that's how it can be in our life. This is a major problem. I think this is the American Christian problem. There are so many good things that they crowd out 
what God wants to do in our life. Because we have a whole pile of Christians that are really not living productive lives. They're never, not really producing seeds. They're producing back the seed that was sown into them. And they're good things. I mean, work is a good thing. Family is a good thing. Sports are a good thing. All these activities are good things. But we got to keep it right where they're not crowding out what God's best is in our life. Uh, this is an example of a good thing, right? It helps us to do great things. But we can let this crowd out our life. Matt was telling me that he read some study that people on the average, and I don't know if it's just kids or whatever, they're looking at their phone once every 12 minutes. Whether there's anything on or whether there's a notification or not, they're, they're there. Okay, it's, it's an example of what can be a weed in our life. It's a good thing. We went to the fair last night. I'll just a little short story. We went to the fair last Sunday night, and we were standing in the scone line. It was about an hour long. And so we're standing in the scone line, and the people right behind us were listening to the guy right behind them who was on his phone. And he was talking about something that was frivolous or something. And the guy that was right behind us said this statement. He goes, if, um, if Alexander Graham Bell heard this conversation, he'd be ashamed that he ever had this invention. <laughs> you know? It was just an example of something that was good, but it's just used, being used for frivolousness, right? And so the, the challenge is that we not let our life be consumed by those things that are not really the true value. They're not really the important thing. Now, Jesus talked about this extensively. And let me just give you a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 6 where he's given us a sermon on the mount. When you're on your notes, if you have time, you can turn there. But he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve two things. You can't try and grow weeds and plants at the same time. One's going to dominate. And the, one's gonna get, the, the one that you want is going to get crowded out. So he said you can't serve both God and money. You can't serve those two things. Before that, in verse 21, he says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure, where you put your treasure, that's where your heart's going to go. It's not where your heart's at, that's where your treasure's going to go. Where you put your treasure, that's where your heart's going to go. You can't, you can't have um, two different have tried to serve two different things. Um, in Matthew 6, 33, he said, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. If you seek these things, you aren't going to get God's kingdom and his righteousness, right? Because he said you can't serve two masters. But if you seek God's kingdom, then all these other things in life can be added in there. Because you're going to have his first, and he's going to, he's going to, Bless us in that. He's going to prosper us in that. Another verse, Matthew, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. It says, A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. What you sow, you will reap. That's a promise. That is a truth. And so it's important that we let, make sure that we are weeding out the worries in our life. Don't let those, those things, all the other stuff, all the other concerns... Get in there and crowd out the seed. Let the seed get light. Let the seed be nourished as it needs to be. So that's the third soil. Now the fourth soil is this, the good soil. In verse 20, others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. If you're wondering, that's the one we want to be, right? That's the one we're all we're even after. You know, the purpose for planting is not for planting's sake. The purpose for planting is for production. And the amazing thing is that God plant seeds in our lives. Now, the picture I have here is um, two weeks ago we had a baptism up at a cabin, and that's Kenzie and, and Caitlin getting baptized. These are two girls that are wanting to pursue after God, so a step of obedience is to get baptized. And we had a unique thing. They said, can we have a synchronized baptism? They wanted to get baptized again, and we're going to try to feed the seed as much as we can, right? We're going to try and help them to grow in the relationship of God. And so when you have a friend that's pursuing after God, that's that much more. So we, hey, sure, we'll do that. And so there was a picture of them getting baptized, uh, you know, the, the synchronized baptism. We never had one of those before. But that was a fun time. There are those areas in our life that we're going to try to feed because we want to see production come. God wants to see production come, and we want to honor God. I, I got about six points that I want to note about this whole parable that Jesus said. They're on your paper there. The first thing is this, that Jesus is talking here to an agrarian society, and the farmer was dependent on the productivity of his crops. Now, my little garden, and a lot of these pictures, um, David, he sent me the past pictures of the production from his garden. So you've seen some of these pictures of tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of stuff, and him with his kids. And, and, uh, and um, it's a hobby garden, right? His life is not dependent on whether his garden produces or not. And that day, if the garden didn't produce, they starved in the winter, right? 
The challenge is this. In our spiritual life, we can often think like we're on a, it's a spiritual hobby, right? We're choosing to do that. When the reality is, if we don't pursue this, our spiritual life is going to starve. So it's, it's important that we don't, you know, just live our lives like, hey, this is a hobby, this is a hobby, this is a hobby. But that we really realize that, you know what, this spiritual thing, the spiritual soul of my heart is really important. It's, it's really important to get in line. The second point is this, that the farmer's not sparing with the seed. In verse 24 of, uh, of, of Mark chapter 4, it says this, With the measure you use, it will be measured for you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. There's another verse, I don't have it on your paper, but 2 Corinthians 9.6, it says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. You know, the, the farmer, he didn't go, do not get any seeds in that hard soil. Because if we get seeds, that's lost seed. He was willing to throw some seeds there because some of those seeds, the, the, with the hope of the, the, they're being productive, those seeds, maybe the rocks get pulled out of there and it can become good soil. Or the weeds get pulled out of there and it can become good soil. Last week, Pastor Matt talked about relentless love. And he talked about the parable of the, of the uh, lost sheep. The 99, he had the 100 sheep, one of them was lost. And how the farmer, if you remember, what is the farmer, how long did he look for that sheep for? He looked for it until he found it. He went after that sheep. And this is a shameless plug. If you did not hear last week's message, it was an awesome message. Go to our Park Ridge Community Church app, download it, and all the messages are there. So I encourage you. But he was talking about the relentless love of God. We have a, a, a relentless farmer. The farmer's throwing out seed. He's not going, oh, I just want to you know, throw it He knows that what he sows, he's going to reap. So he's going to sow bountifully. And that's a principle that God has in our lives. The next thing is kind of a funky thing that I made up. It's called the farming matrix. I'm, I call it the farming matrix. Okay? And you have it on your paper. Try and follow along, because I think it's got some great principles in it. So this little matrix, this two by two matrix, we have these four kinds of soils. There's the hard soil, the shallow soil, the crowded soil, and the good soil. Now, the horizontal matrix, we go from less depth to more depth. Okay? So the hard soil has pretty much zero depth. The shallow soil has zero depth, but the good soil could have great depth, and the, and the, and the um, crowded soil could have good depth. It's the, that, that shallow soil, it's what's going on, on underneath the ground. Those rocks that are crowding the roots from really getting a good root hole, okay? So the shallow soil has to do with the roots and how deep they're growing. And then along the vertical axis, or the, the left-hand axis, is the distractions. So there's this issue of, of the... Um, the hard soil has, or the crowded soil has a lot of distractions, and the hard soil has distractions. It's not weeds in the hard soil, it's, it's the distractions of all the seed that the seed can't get, or the, all the, the dirt, the seeds can't get down there. It's compressed dirt, it's that distraction. But you go, go from the more distractions, trying to get to less distractions in our lives. And that's going to give good soil. Now, the crowded soil, that was all about what was going on above the ground, right? The, the shallow soil, the roots couldn't grow. They couldn't get a good stand, uh, hold, and they dried up when it got dry. But the crowded soil, those the leaves could never get any good sun. They couldn't get the nutrition they need from the sun. And so it was getting those distractions out of their life. And so that's kind of a challenge for each one of us. What are the things that we need to, the distractions we need to diminish in life, what are the things that we need to do to grow depth in our life? I made up just a little list of things, I, and, and you can jot these down or put them in your memory or whatever. What are some things that we can do to grow depth in our life? The first thing is, we can let God's love motivate your life. Let God's love be the thing that drives us in our life every day. Number two, live in obedience to God's word. Now, if we're going to live in obedience to God's word, that means we have to let God's word get in our life. So get on some kind of reading schedule, kind of some kind of listening to the, the Bible reading apps on your phone. Or, so get on some kind of thing where you're letting God's word get into your life. If you don't do it, it's not going to grow. And you're not going to get depth in God's word. It's going to be, you're, you're going to live a shallow life. The third thing is determined to be a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner, a student. The wild at heart thing is a great guy, thing for guys to establish relationships and to work through. The, the, the wild at heart is about the three, um, the three passions of a man's heart. An adventure to fight, a battle to win, and a beauty to rescue. And, and it's all about that and how we really live out who God has made us to be. So small groups. In relationships with other people. There's these things you can do. And then, the, and then the fourth thing I wrote down is commitment to God through prayer. Prayer is our communication with God. 
We can go to all kinds of other people with our concerns, with our troubles in life, or we can go to God with them. Now, if you haven't noticed, if you've been around here for any time at all, you may recognize this list of four things, what they are, sorry. They're first four of our seven core values, okay, of our church. That God's love that motivates our lives. Obedience to the Bible, God's inspired word. Discipleship. We are all being disciples and we're making disciples. And then, and then um, uh, prayer, a daily part of our lives. So those are some ways that we can grow depth in our life. And then how can we get rid of distractions? Well, I think that Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, is really an important principle to live in life. Where are you putting your treasure? If you're putting your treasure in all kinds of other things, you're going to be distracted by those other things. We're going to be distracted by those other things. If you want to live a, a life that is good soil, put your distraction in the right place. Last night I got a call from someone that had gotten married, that was some, grown up in our church, and got married four or five years ago. And um, they live out of state, and this girl's calling up, and she said, Hey, um, my husband and I had a talk today, and he thinks we need to have a, like a time of separation. And uh, she was kind of, she was heartbroken. And uh, so we talked about, you know, what's been going on in her life. Well, he doesn't really like the things that I like to do, and I don't really get off on the things that he likes to do. And so he just says, Hey, listen, we don't have the same likes anymore. We probably should have gotten married. So instead of living a life that's not, you know, we're not really thriving together. Let's just separate, and, and maybe we can find someone else that will help us to really find our path. And I said, this is the classic Matthew 6, 21 principle in your life. Where are your treasures at? That's where your heart will be. If you guys will choose to put your treasures in each other, your heart will naturally follow back there. As you're putting your treasures in these things out here, no wonder you're wandering apart and feeling like, hey, we should be separated. So my encouragement is put your treasure in God, because that has drifted apart. And put your treasure in each other. And as you do that, you will see your heart grow back together. This was, what were they? They're distracted by all kinds of other things in life. And they're chasing after those other things in life. So, so this is the challenge. To put the, put to, to, to live our lives with depth and a little more depth and less distractions in our lives. This whole matrix. Okay, number four. And I think my slide on number four is uh, one soul, one, only one soil never had life in it. And this is a picture from a couple weeks ago. There was a mud bump. And it's just a, another shameless plug. Next Saturday down in Snohomish, our friend Matt Rainey and his ministry, Adventure Soccer, this is one of their fundraisers. They're doing another mud run. So if you want, you can just you can look up uh, Snohomish Mud Run or something. You can probably get a, go, go to it. It's a fun thing. Anyways, so this is before and then the next one's going to be after. But anyways, there's the only one soil never had life in it. The shallow soil, the crowded soil, the good soil, those all had life. It was only the hard soil that didn't have life. And, and it's important that we that we realize that, you know what, there's a lot of people that we've got to get rid of that crowding. We've got to get rid of that, that, that shallowness in people's lives, in our own life, in our own life. And then conversely, there's only one soil that ever produced fruit. The hard soil, the crowded soil, the shallow soil never produced fruit, but that good soil produced fruit. Now, Okay, we got, there's four soils and one produced fruit. Does that mean 25% of the, of the seeds that got cast out produced fruit? Or do you think a farmer is like, there's some seed that fell among path. There's some seed that fell among the, the, the shallow, you know, the rocky soil. There's some seed that fell among the weedy soil. But most of it he was throwing out into the good soil, right? I think that's how it is. And I think that's what God wants in our lives. But there's some amazing things that go on. Do you know how many Christians ever lead someone else to Christ? Percentage-wise, any guesses? Three, it's the huh? Ten, five. Yeah, five is the answer. But anyway, it's only five percent Christians are really classified in this good soil. That's kind of a sad thing. When I am working with someone and they pray with someone else to become a Christian for the first time, I shake their hand and say, "Welcome to the five percent club," because only five percent Christians ever do this. Now. Now, that's in Christianity overall. I hope that we have a church where we're 100% in that club, okay? That we're leading people. And, and, and when we talk about it, we have, where we put our treasure there, our heart follows after. So we do have a much higher percentage. I don't know what it is. But we have a much higher percentage than that. But that's just a sad state of Christianity, that only 5%. So here, you know, it's only 5% is really in the good soil category. God wants, God wants it to be much higher. He creates much higher. I put a, a, another little interesting statistic on your on your diagram there um at the age at which americans accept jesus christ as their savior and this is from october 2017 a study then and look at that under age 13 46 percent of kids accept christ or, or christians today accepted christ when they're under age 13 
And then 13 to 17, 22%. So 68% of people that are Christian became a Christian when they were under the age of 18 years old. Why is that? Because their heart's not hard. They still have a tender heart. They're willing to receive. That's why we put energy into kids. Okay, that's why we do the preschool. That's why we do the kids connection. That's why we do blast. That's why we're building this 37,000 square foot building out here to try to reach out to the community because we're trying to put our seed where it's productive. We're trying to help kids to grow up. Maybe they will be shallow soils or maybe they will be weedy soils and they will you know, never become, and, and, you know, and, and maybe in, the, in some years, high school years, where they kind of fall away from God. But when we plant those seeds, the chances are they're going to come back to it. And so that's why we do it. And that's why we try to live that way. So those are just some principles that I saw lived out. There's some points to make about that I saw lived out in this, this story. The last point is this, is that the soil principle works on all areas of life, okay? The soil principle works in all areas. There may be areas in your marriage where you're hard, or where you're shallow, or where you're um, crowded, you've let things crowd out, like that story I told you about, about this person I talked to last night, or there may be gray areas. I mean, my wife and I, we have areas that we talk about, you know what, we're letting these other things crowd out the time that we need to have together. So this works in marriage, it works in your Christian growth, it works in parenting, it works in relationships, it works with students to parents, uh, students to their parents. You can, students can have hard hearts towards their parents and not let that let the parents, the seed their parents are sowing, give them their heart. It can work in in, in, in with teachers, friends, and so there's all these areas that this that, that this applies to. So I don't know, there may be areas in your life you're thinking about, wow, these are some areas that I have hard So these are areas that I have shallow. My hope today is that we say, you know what, I am choosing to do, to have good soul in my life. And this leads me to my last statement or question, is what word did Jesus repeat 13 times in this chapter? Now, you are at a disadvantage here because I skipped a bunch of the verses that had this word in it, okay? But he started off the story and he said, listen, and then midway, he told the story about the seeds, and then he talked for a couple minutes, in, or a couple verses. And then in verses 9 through 12, he says, verse 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Remember, listen, hear. And then when he finishes off the story, in verse 21, he says, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And in verse 24, consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. In this chapter, 13 times this whole idea of hearing, he uses that word or he uses that idea. 13 times in this chapter. Now, it's not just about, I heard the words, and now I'm going to do what I was doing before. It's about a hearing and applying in life. In James, it talks about this. In James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So don't just read your Bible and then don't do it. Don't change. Do what it tells you to do. And then he said, James goes on, he says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And then he sees a splotch on his face or some blemish on his face and he goes away and doesn't do anything about it. He says, that's what the person is that reads the word and doesn't do what it says. But in verse 25, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what is heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in all that he does. In, in Jesus, in the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he had the story of the wise man and the foolish man. And that's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, so hears these words and puts them into practice, is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Rains came down, the streams rose, the only thing that blew and beat against that house, but it didn't fall. But he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who was like on a sand. He built his house, the rains came down, beat against the house, and it fell because it did not have a foundation. It did not. The difference in the whole story was doing versus not doing. They both heard, one did, one did not do. So my encouragement is we have our worship team come forward this morning, is evaluate what type of soil are you in life. This is why Jesus told the story. He didn't tell it to make us, you know, take some time up. No, no, he told the story so that we can evaluate where am I at in my life and what are the changes that I need to make to pursue forward. So you may be a person saying, you know what, I have spiritually had a hard heart. I have not really received God. At the end of, I'm going to pray. We're going to have, you're going to have opportunity that you could pray a prayer yourself and say, Jesus, 
come into my life, forgive me my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I want to have a tough talk with him or her to you. Or you may uh, have other areas in your life. You can say, hey, you know what? I've been kind of shallow in this area. I've let other things, pressure and troubles and challenges in life, keep me from really pursuing after for God. I'm going to get those rocks out of my life. I'm going to work at removing rocks from my life. Um, my lot is an acre and a half. And, and I bought it. The people before we built a house, the people before us had really manicured lawns, but it all got way wild and crazy. I mean, years ago. I, so I just come across relics of this previous garden and stuff like that. And I brought a whole bunch of dirt in to kind of level it all out. And there's a ton of rocks in that dirt. So I have a tractor and I go around and rake it. And there's just a ton of dirt. Now, as I've been working on sections of the yard, as I rake it, bring up all these rocks, rake them out by hand, put them in a pile, scoop them up, throw them in the tractor, take them dump them in a rock pile, go over again. Pretty soon I get where there's not very many rocks. So this is possible. In our life, when we have rocks, if we work at getting the rocks out of our life, we can get good soil. And that's my goal, is to have good soil for my, 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 my lawn. Or there may be that area of distraction. Say, you know, I need to put my focus, put my treasure in God's principles in my life and not let these distractions and all kinds of other stuff get in. Or you may go, you know what, I am doing these things and I'm going to continue doing these things. And make a commitment to say, God, I'm going to continue after you. So let's all stand this morning. Let's join in this, in this worship time.
want us to be, God, as we're all gathered this morning, there may be some people that have said, hey, I realize I have hardness in my heart. Maybe people, maybe hardness towards ever receiving you, Jesus, to break apart that hardness. So we pray this prayer and say, dear Jesus, would you come into my life? Forgive me of my sins. I want to follow after you. I acknowledge that you died on the cross and you rose again for my sins. I choose to make you the Lord of my life today. God, you hear that simple prayer. By that simple prayer, God, you start breaking apart the hearts in our hearts. God, maybe there's other areas we've been shallow. We've got the pressures, the troubles of this life. Keep us from focusing on you. In our, in, our, in our spiritual journey, our spiritual life has dried up. God, help us to pursue you. Get rid of those rocks in our life. And in those areas that we've let other distractions get in and crowd out what you want to do, God. Let weeds get in, thorns get in. God, that you would help us to eliminate the distractions, Father. Choose to focus our heart on you. Put our treasure in you and your kingdom. God, that we can follow after you. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for the goodness that you do in our lives. That as we pursue after you, Father, you do make good soil out of our hearts, God. And God, we rejoice in every good heart, God. Every heart that has got good soil, Father. And seeing your production from your kingdom work out in their lives, God. And seeing the blessings of your kingdom work out in their lives, God. Help us to keep after that. Help us to continue to weed. Help us to continue to remove rocks. Help us to break apart that fallow ground, God. This is your kingdom. God, that you go with us today, Father. Empower us this week as we go out and live our lives, Father, for your kingdom and your glory, God. Bring hope to those that don't have hope, Jesus. Thank you for every person that's here this morning, God. Taking these steps to live in the life of good soil, Jesus. In your holy name.